Um, hello and welcome to this presentation on increasing biodiversity on allotments and orchards, um, which is brought to you um, by Social Farms and Gardens. Uh, my name is Louise Cartwright and I'm going to be presenting for you today. So before we kick off, just a little bit about me. Um, so I'm um, a freelance horticultural trainer. I'm also an egg in mentor and a smallholder um, with previous experience um, helping to manage a hundred acre biodi biodynamic farm. So I currently work for Camarium Renewable Energy on the Feeding Our Community project, which aims to teach, motivate and inspire our local communities to grow, store and prepare food in publicly accessible green spaces. So I previously worked as a project officer for the Growing Better Connections project, which was working with um, land landowners in North East Pembrokeshire to create bigger, better and more joined up habitat networks. So essentially trying to enhance biodiversity across Pembrokeshire. I'm also a freelancer for the amazing Social Farms and Gardens. Um, so that's great. And after this presentation, if you want to contact me, my email is going to be at the end. Um, so what I'm going to cover today is basically spend the session today introducing the following topics. So we'll chat a bit about how a hedge can help. Um, then we'll chat about how an edge can help. Um, the importance of wildflower areas, um, brambles. Can they be a blessing? Um, notes on bees and different types of pollinators. Um, ivy and it, how it can be an ally for biodiversity. Um, top tips for creating wet areas. And I'm also going to outline easy steps to become a biodiversity recorder. So, so how a hedge can help. So hedges are super important on your plot or in your orchard as they not only provide shelter for your fruit trees and crops but they provide much needed protection for nesting birds as well as mammals um, so they act as like a protective corridor between green spaces so where smaller birds and mammals can forage for food without being preyed upon by predators so a diverse hedge made up of flowering plants not only provides nectar and forage for a variety of insects, it also this also then turns into food for birds and those mammals. So some hedge species provide habitat for what's known as protected and priority Welsh species. So, for example, um, in our, my area, North East Pembrokeshire, um, there's a lot of hazel hedges. Um, hazel is really important because it's favoured by the dormouse. And also blackthorn, there's a lot of blackthorn hedges around here, and that's also important because it's favoured by the brown hair streak butterfly. Um, so essentially, if you've got more flowering plants on your plot, that results in more insects, which in turn pollinate your crops or your apple trees and attract birds to act as your very, very own biological pest control. So um, we've been working with lots of community groups to plant different native hedges and the species I think maybe to consider in your hedge design would include alder, it's a really great nitrogen fixer, hazel, um, you get nuts and also it's amazing for dormice, hawthorn or blackthorn, the quickthorns, amazing blossom, loads of berries. Um, elderberry, again, it's a shrub, very big and it's got lots of berries, wild cherry, hornbeam, uh, lime, spindle, spindle's amazing, dog rose, dogwood, beech and oak. Um, there's lots of information out there about that. Um, you can chat to people like the Woodland Trust or um, Keep Wells Tidy, but I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so local provenance and nature's allies. So when planting a hedge and sourcing trees, a good rule of thumb is to plant trees grown as locally to where your allotment or orchard are as possible. These are what's known um, as local provenance. So each tree sapling you buy will have its own plant passport. And this passport has an associated number which relates to the location of where the tree seed was gathered and grown. So in this part of Wales, 303 trees are our local provenance. So um, 
as ask your tree supplier about the provenance and if they have the stocks available request the provenance that is closest to where your plot or orchard is um, so essentially those trees will just do better because they're grown locally. Um, in terms of nature's ally, a particular ally for the allotment here are members of the tit family. <laughs> Blue tits are a whole nesting bird and they forage for food close to their nest site, picking hundreds of caterpillars a day um, to support their brood. Um, so you can use a standard tree in your hedge to site tit boxes or site them on poles around your plot or your orchard. And essentially, they'll do some of the work for you in terms of picking off the caterpillars off your cabbage plants. The tits are amazing. So in terms of like a bit more information, I've just very, that was a very brief information about hedges. Um, there's loads of amazing organisations that you could look into. So the Long Forest Project is um, a project run by Keep Wells Tidy and they produce a, um, a variety of excellent resource packs um, ranging from hedge design to maintenance. And these are totally free to download. So you can click on that link and they're totally free. Um, the Woodland Trust has information about different trees and their functions on their website. So if you want any more information about which one flowers and when and what berries and whatnot, you can go onto the Woodland Trust website. They also offer, if you're a community group, they offer subsidised tree packs. Um, so you can basically buy a load of trees at a subsidised rate. Or if you want to, you could um, apply for one of their grant schemes. So um, they've got two, one of them's called More Hedges and the other one's called More Woods. Um, I've myself have, um, applied for a More Hedges grant scheme and it's very, for a community group I was working with, and it's very, very simple and very straightforward. So they basically pay for some or all of your trees, guards and canes, depending on what the scheme you go for. So the one I went for, I think we paid about 15%. And the rest was covered by the Woodland Trust. So it's pretty amazing. There's also another grant giving body called I Dig Trees. They offer free, completely free tree packs for community groups. Um, but you have to go with their, um, their ratio of trees. Um, but they're all native and they're local provenance. So again, I've used I Dig Trees and I can vouch for them. They're very good. <laughs> um, but if you opt to source and pay for your own trees, um, British hardwood trees are an excellent supplier um, and they supply native tree species and there's also another nursery called Ashbridge trees um, and they provide less common species so sometimes some tree suppliers won't supply spindle for example because it can be quite rare so you could get that from Ashbridge trees. Um, if you would like to provide nesting sites on your orchard allotment, I would recommend this amazing book called Nest Boxes, Your Complete Guide. And it essentially provides a step-by-step -step instructions for how to build every kind of nest box. Um, so we'll briefly chat about edges. Um, so an edge, so there's a thing called the edge effect. Um, and it's an ecological concept. And it basically describes how there's a greater diversity of life in the region where the edges of two adjacent ecosystems overlap, such as a hedge or you know, otherwise known as a linear woodland and a grassland. So at the edge of these two overlapping ecosystems, you can find species from both of the ecosystems, as well as unique species that aren't found in either. Um, so these, these and they're sort of specially adapted to those conditions or the transition zone between the two edges. So as a result, there's a greater number of mutually beneficial relationships between the elements at the edges. Um, edges serve as, a, as an energy trap since they are points where materials, nutrients and organisms flow across ecosystems. Um, there's increased cycling of materials and nutrients at the edges. Um, they also create benefit, beneficial microclimates. Um, and they're important in supporting biodiversity and, the, and in the production of biomass. So essentially on, on your plot or in your orchard to make the best use of the edge effect, you could leave a meter or so of grass adjacent to the hedge, which you could cut once or twice a year after the grasses and wildflowers have seeded. So essentially be creating like a little linear wildflower meadow next to your hedge. And often in my experience, um, because there's lots of really beneficial relationships in the hedge already, because there's loads of often there, the mycelium is really developed. The grass and um, next to the hedge grows really well and it has like really quite a diverse sward. So um, it's really very good. <laughs> That's the edge effect. <laughs> 
Um, so the other thing to consider um, is perhaps creating wildflower areas. So essentially, a wildflower is a flower that grows in the wild. It's not, it's essentially, it's not been intentionally seeded or planted. So if there's an area on your allotment or in your orchard where you'd like to see wildflowers, your best option to encourage a meadow is essentially by effective management. So you could do this, there's many ways that you could do this, but I'm just sort of, I'm gonna go through eight, eight ways <laughs> first, first way. Um, if you cut late in the season, so basically you cut late in the season once the grasses and flowers have gone to seed. So you're basically trying to promote the seed. Um, so you need to, the second way is you essentially you need to decrease the fertility. So in order to do that, you need to clear the grass away to decrease the fertility. So don't let it rot back down. The third way is um, you, you need to keep a check on problem plants. So um, things that sort of are really prolific. So like docks, um, thistles and nettles. Having a few is good, but sometimes because they're so well adapted, they can take over large areas. So make sure that they sort of you keep a check on them. So the fourth one is avoid compacting the ground. Um, the fifth one is avoid changing conditions. So be mindful of weather patterns in terms of when to cut. So just basically just look at your meadow. And if, for example, it's been a really wet summer or been a really hot summer, the conditions will change. So you might have to cut depending on the weather conditions. Um, the sixth one is have faith in nature. Um, wildflowers will appear when conditions are favourable. So um, the seventh one is if your orchard is large enough, consider whether grazing is practical for you because actually the addition of some grazing animals is really good for creating a wildflower meadow because sometimes you can go too far the other way where there's um, very little fertility and you actually need to put a little bit of fertility back through the for the manure from the grazing animals but you can put them in for a short space of time um, and then the eighth one is to avoid if you can planting a seed mix aha so why <laughs> so a note on wildflower seed mixes so um, most of the seed mixes not most but not all so most are um, include annual plants such as poppies and cornflowers. So in theory, at the end of the season, they should drop their seed and it should replenish itself. However, in practice, this isn't, isn't always the case. So the next, so the resulting display, so the next year won't be, um, won't be as, will be less impressive essentially. Um, the brightly coloured species which make up some seed meat mixes aren't actually native. Um, and Unfortunately, this could mean that they could displace some native wildflowers already existence in your seed bank. Um, so which could actually erode the local distinctive wildflower diversity. This could even become invasive if they were introduced in the wrong play, place, which could actually cause a bit of pressure on local biodiversity. Um, another consideration is that many of our Welsh pollinators are limited in the range and specifically adapted to feed from specific plants. So pollinators thrive on the flowers which are native to the same region as they are. So those to which they're best adapted essentially. So in introducing a seed mix containing species that aren't generally found in their region can have little or no benefit to the native pollinators of that region. Um, so essentially, instead of actually spending loads of money on seed, you could just let nature do the work for you. And um, essentially the best thing to do to encourage native seed bank is, is through a change of management. So by cutting letting, and letting them go to seed, cut after, take the, take the fertility off. Um, and essentially this is the most sustainable method of increasing the area and extent of wildflowers in your grassland or in your orchard or your allotment. Um, so that was a very whistle stop tour of wildflower meadows but there again there's some incredible organizations out there that provide really great free resources that you can download so i'd really recommend these two documents by um the organization called plant life so the first one is the principles of good meadow management and managing meadows of all sizes with mowing and then 
this this little schematic there sort of shows you when you can choose if you want to do it sort of naturally without seed mixes you can do it this way so you obviously cut you don't mow until july you cut and then you leave and then you cut in sort of february march time uh, but all of that information again is on the plant life website um brambles so brambles um are they a blessing <laughs> well um a small stand a stand of brambles they have enormous benefits to wildlife so essentially um the song our song thrush um it suffers if if a if, if a big stand of bramble is removed because they favor a dense bramble thicket for nesting in because it keeps them safe from predators um as you know berries are great everybody loves the berries but they're not only for us but they're also really important food for many birds and mammals including again the hazel dormouse I keep going on about the dormouse but um, obviously protecting priority species so they're really important um, so in autumn you may also find fox or badger poo turn bright purple from the berries they've been feasting on so they they you know it's a really important food source for them um, the flowers also provide nectar and poll pollen for many invertebrates also the wild, lots of Welsh pollinators feed on brambles um, there. So they, as you know, if you try to pull them out, <laughs> they're very spiky and extremely dense, but they create such safe places for things like hedgehogs to shelter in and to move on. Um, they also, the jagged edges of a bramble thicket creates microclimates for basking reptiles. So um, I know obviously that it is, the, you know, your whole allotment can't just be brambles because you do need to grow food and your whole <laughs> orchard also you need to have some apples you know there has to be like a balance but if if you've got an area which you don't necessarily need to be in and there are brambles there and you can leave them then that would be super duper for wildlife it'd be amazing for biodiversity if you could leave them and because also it's it's great for it not to be tidy you know i mean it's got its own sort of beauty as well <laughs> so brambles are a blessing <laughs> next one uh, just a bit of a note on bees as well so this is just a little bit um to consider um for other bee species essentially so there's just one species of honeybee in britain um and europe it's called the western or european honeybee i can't really pronounce the latin but i'll try the apis mellifera and they're not actually at threat of extinction in the UB, in the UK. Honeybees are doing well. Um, in contrast, there are over 15 other pollinator species in the UK, including over 270 of our own wild bee species, as well as um, hoverflies, moths and butterflies. So more than half of the bee, butterfly and moth species in the UK have declined in the past 50 years. And actually, unfortunately, like 62 of our species have gone completely extinct. Um, so, so there's an increase, it's actually a bit of a concern that declines in our wild populators, uh, populators, pollinators, may be worsened by high, like a really high density of honeybees. Um, as because one honeybee hive can contain over like 40,000 bees. Um, so if you say if you introduce a lot of these hives, so I don't know, if you introduce 10 honeybee hives into an area um, that they wouldn't necessarily have been, they, they would actually start competing with other wild species for food and resources. Um, so that actually could put a strain on your native wild bees that are already in the area. Um, they've also, unfortunately, sometimes they've, not all the time, but sometimes honeybee hives have been known to spread um, disease to the wild bee population say for example if like you're setting up a new apiary and it's got like 20 or 30 hives in and into a place where there wasn't there was no none before so it can it can actually be quite devastating for the local population um, so yeah for example if it was introduced into an area where the rare there was a rare bumblebee you've got 30 new hives um, it could it could potentially be the end of that population however never fear never fear so um you could actually instead of instead of say like you think oh you know you might have an, a, your lovely orchard like right I've got space for thirty hives here but thirty hives instead of deciding to put lots of honeybee hives what you could do um instead of producing those you could essentially create sort of a bug or a bee hotel 
And you can do this really easily by creating what's known as a bee bank, which is essentially in your newly planted hedge, <laughs> which is on your allotment or in your orchard. You can basically have like a, a bank where um which is clear a little bit clear of vegetation where the bees burrow into and this is like i absolutely ideal habitat amazing um but there's there's another great organization called bug life they has that have created an excellent resource booklet just explaining how to do that as well um the other thing is to actually um do yourself a favor and resist tidying um so <laughs> like you don't need to tidy it's fine <laughs> so like Bumblebee queens and caterpillars overwinter in the tussocky grass and, and also at the bases of the plants. So if you leave, you, maybe next to your bramble area, <laughs> if you leave a wild area and you unmow it over the winter, you're, you're basically providing sort of crucial habitats for the queens and the caterpillars to, to overwinter in those months. Um, some species also overwinter in the dry stems of dead plants too. So if you, if you, um, clear out your flower beds too early you could actually be taking away their habitat so just leave it it's fine it looks great <laughs> um, yeah so I, it's quite hard to just it, you sort of if you resist the urge to tidy you'll be increasing like op opportunities for bio biodiversity tenfold um, yeah so like some dead stems like um, yeah it, they actually raise the temperature a bit so that um, the the queens and the caterpillars can survive over the winter. Um, yes. So that's that's the note on uh, native pollinators. <laughs> um, so the next thing is just a bit about ivy. And I don't, it depends, you probably, maybe if you've got an established allotment in the, you might have some ivy or it's growing on some of the trees again, if you're like on your orchard plot, if, um, if it's an established health hedge and you're planting some new trees, there might be ivy there. Um, so it actually often gets blamed for strangling and killing trees. So so when, say, I don't know if you, I've, I've seen this when I've been walking in my local woodland, I often see where it's been cut at the base or removed from trees entirely. Um, it's actually a bit of a myth. Uh, it's most probably stemmed from the fact that if a tree is already dead or dying, the weight of ivory can actually bring it down because it's really heavy. Um, the plant itself doesn't cause any harm to the tree. And it's actually amazing for wildlife. It's amazing. Um, so there's at least 50 of our like Welsh pollinators that are reliant on it. And it's linked to providing habitats and work for pollinators. And it's one of the best, one of the last plants to flower before winter takes hold. So, so without it, um, some of our pollinators wouldn't have the opportunity to feed up and be in prime condition to survive the harsh winter months. Um, birds also get a bit of a boost from ivy, from um, the berries, and they also shelter within the depths of it. And it's also actually really good habitat for bats because a lot of bats um, sort of roost inside the dense thicket as well as in between like the bark on trees. Uh, yeah, ivy's good. So next thing to chat about is um, if you've got space on your allotment or in your orchard is maybe consider creating a wet area. Um, so the another great organisation called the Amphibium and Reptile Conservation Trust, they claim that garden ponds are an important refuge for our native species, in particular, freshwater invertebrates and amphibians. So creating a pond is the single greatest thing you can do <laughs> to boost wildlife in your area, as well as bring nature right to your doorstep. So that's what the Amphibians and Reptile Conservation Trust are claiming. So I think it's, it sounds like it's quite a good idea. Um, so there's several things to consider if you'd like to install a pond on your allotment or in your orchard. So the first thing is use rainwater. So tap water is usually has high levels of dissolved nitrogen and phosphorus in it. Um, so it's a good idea not to use tap water if you can. Um, so you could set up a water butt on your garden shed and use it basically to fill your pond. Um, next thing is providing homes for aquatic creatures by essentially making a natural edge with really shallow water. So it's all about having lots of edge and lots of shallow water. Um, again, shallow ponds are ideal. That's that's where most of the interactions happen. Again, it's about edge. It's between the edge where the pond is and where the grass is. Um, 
The other thing is to, you can use sand and wash gravel to plant into. Um, and then be, be again, be patient. Like wildlife will arrive naturally, so you don't necessarily have to introduce stuff into your pond. It will just show up, which is incredible. <laughs> um, so the other thing to think about is um, you might be really keen to have some fish, but maybe really carefully consider this because um, unless your pond is a particularly big size, they generally can overwhelm a small pond. Um, the other thing, the final thing, is that trees and falling leaves, they provide food, shelter and mildewing materials for insects. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to have some leaves in your pond. It's actually really good. Um, again, the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust um, have created a host of free, again, free resources. You can just go on their website and download them and learn all that you need to know. Um, there's a really great handbook called Creating Ponds for Wildlife, which I would recommend. It's really easy to read and explains everything in a lot more detail. Um, so the last thing I was going to chat about, really, is this the last thing? Yes, um, is become a recorder. <laughs> so, oh, so the, basically the thing about, to say about this is the people, people who take time to observe nature and record their findings are super super extremely super important from a citizen science perspective so they provide scientists with the important new biodiversity information that contributes to nature conservation planning research and education so that's that that's the thing that's the you know so there's several recording methods hosted by different groups organizations and charities that you could try if you want to become a recorder um however to start you off um, here are two which I, I would recommend to try. The first um, is called the Lurk app, and that's hosted by the West Wales Biodiversity Information Centre. So Lurk <laughs> allows you to contribute your species sightings with like a specific GPS acquired coordinate, and um, it has descriptions and also of information of what you've seen. Um, they also have like specific project coordinators who will help you to identify species that you're unsure about. So you can just actually you can just actually call them up. And I have done this, give them a photo and go, what's this? <laughs> if you're not sure. So um, the second in and this is which um, social farms and gardens are working with in partnership with are the 2023 Big Butterfly Count. And that began on Friday the 14th of July and, and it's happening until August the 6th, which is a Sunday. So it's actually, really, if you want to become a recorder, I would recommend this is like an amazing first step to do it. So it's really easy to do to be part of the Big Butterfly Camp. If there's like, there's four steps. First step is you download their free app off their website. Or if you don't have a smartphone, you can download the ID chart from the website. Uh, the second thing is you basically choose the same spot in your orchard or on your allotment and this is where you're going to spot butterflies and moths so essentially you sit there for 15 minutes when you're there and then you record as many of the species that you can see um so then the third thing to do so once you've spent 15 minutes doing this you've got your notes you spend it all on third thing is you actually can add the counts directly onto their website or or via the app so if you're out there with your smartphone you can just put them in the fourth thing is that the Butterfly Conservation Centre also have an interactive map where you can see how your data is actually contributing to research. So you've gone out on your allotment in or in your orchard, you've done your 15 minutes of recording and you're like, ah, oh, this is amazing. It's actually contributing to citizen science data. So it's super, super important. Um, so actually, as an aside, if, for example, you wanted some information about a place, or if you were a planner and you wanted to build a house or whatever, you would get in touch with someone like the West Wales Biodiversity Information Centre and their interactive map would show the planners what was growing in a particular area. And the, quite a lot of their records are based on citizen scientists' records. So it's super, super important that people do this because it shows that it allows you to see what is in a place. Because obviously the West Wales Biodiversity Centre haven't got a million people. To, to go out and record everything so it yeah I would really recommend doing this <laughs> okay uh yes so that's me and that's the end of my presentation so if you've got you know any questions social farms and gardens are amazing go ask them
Um, and then they've got a really great interactive website and there's also a plethora of resources on their website which you can access. Um, and if you have any specific questions about community gardening, they have like project coordinators that are based in different parts of Wales. Um, also, that's my email address if you want to contact me about anything to do with biodiversity. Um, what I'm going to do now for the next like five or five or so minutes is just to answer some of the questions that were raised um, before. So the first question was from a lady called Stella and she said, <clears throat> question was, what about if the area is heavily shaded, i.e. under an oak tree <clears throat> in relation to edges? So I think actually that's pretty good in terms of what I've noticed in, from personal experience of cutting and making hay is that um, <laughs> the, the grass actually grows the best when it's next to the hedge and it's most the, the 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 sward is the most diverse and again that's because of the mycelium relationships that are already happening within the hedge um so it's shade is isn't an issue i'm and it's often quite a common misconception that you get less hay next to a hedge it really isn't the case um but in terms of in terms of, i guess of making a wildflower area next to the hedge is actually quite fertile so you'd have to keep taking you could basically just keep keep taking a cut from um, the area next to the hedge and you get some really amazing hay from it without it like decreasing in its fertility um so that was Stella's question so it's fine basically um the second question was raised by Kath um and then she basically said what species were recommended for the hedgerow she just wanted me to say that again so I will um if I can find it um so I would recommend planting older in your hedge because it's a nitrogen fixer. So essentially that can feed other, other trees within the hedge line. Hazel, because you could get nuts potentially if the squirrels don't get them all. Um, also is again, our favorite dormouse. <laughs> it's European protected <laughs> variety species. Um, also hazel is such an amazing um, resource if you're for your um, allotment, you know, you could tend, you could coppice the poles and make pea sticks, for example, or make frames for your beans. Um, hawthorn and blackthorn, essentially they're the quick thorns. Um, there is a bit of a note on blackthorn. Blackthorn does sucker and uh, the thorns can be quite um, tricky if you get them, you know, if you, if you get if you get one in you, um, however, they are incredible. They are incredible for biodiversity. So um, it's kind of you need to do what's right for you. So, for example, if your allotment plot is, you know, there's lots of children there, maybe, and maybe there's lots of play groups there, maybe consider whether you want to plant blackthorn. But again, hawthorn's also a really good option. Um, elderberry, that's a shrub. It's amazing that you get lots of beautiful flowers, which are really great for hoverflies and butterflies and day flying moths. And then you get incredible berries. And also with an elderberry shrub, essentially, you know, you can let it go into a tree, but essentially you just, if you just keep cutting it back every couple of years, you'll just, it will just keep, loves it. It just keeps coming back. So it's great in a hedge. Um, Wild cherry again, that's amazing. And that's actually, if you let that grow as one of the, one of your standards, the wood's incredible and really well sought after. And obviously you get the, the blossom and the fruit. Um, hornbeam, um, again, it's a bit like beech. It's, um, it displays something called marescence. So it doesn't, it, it keeps its leaves basically in the winter. Um, lime, you can actually eat the leaves of lime. They're actually quite tasty. Yeah, nice small leaf lime. Spindle, that's a very, um, that's a traditional hedge uh, species. Dog rose, again, great for pollinators. Dogwood, pretty good. In fact, it's very, very bushy, very, very like vigorous plant. Um, beech and oak. So, um, I think, you know, sessile oak or pedunculate. I mean, I guess the thing about oak, you'd when you plant oak in your hedge, you'd be wanting it to potentially be the standard in your hedge but you can also like um trim it again because it is like beach as well and then it will keep its leaves for a long time in the winter so that was calf's question uh there was another question um next question was how long will the process take from beginning improvement to having a wildflower meadow um well <sighs> From personal experience, I mean, I, I my this morning you see that picture there is mine, and um, we've basically um, created 
five sort of meadow areas and it's taken about sort of it takes between four and sort of six years for you to see like a real diverse sward so it doesn't actually take that long you just have to keep taking just taking the grass off but obviously this depends <laughs> on where you are and how fertile your land is I'm on I'm high up the soil is really acidic and really well draining so it's probably taken less time here than it would say if you had a beautiful loamy soil next to a riverbed <laughs> and it was really sheltered so it would take longer probably to for the for the fertility to decrease but um I mean I suppose I've just been amazed at how quickly it's happened um so that was that question uh next another question from kath was i work in two community gardens in swansea and i'm looking to introduce a small pond are there any top tips yes there are kath many top tips <laughs> essentially i mean it's a set aside of just repeating that slide again what I would say is really to contact the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust if you want any specifics about how, you know, like how deep to go and how wide the diameter. They also have project officers who can come out and actually come to your site and chat to you about it. Um, I, uh, I, I work with this really amazing chap called Peter Hill and he came to a site I was working with and really helped us to de develop a series of shallow ponds, which is great. Um, so yeah, I would recommend um, checking them out, checking out their website. Hope that's okay, Kath. Um, next one, and the last one was from Dan. Uh, and he said, there is a lot of hogweed in the allotment this year, making access hard. And Dan is from an established site in North Flintshire. So um, in terms of, again, you know, uh, the note that I said about um, you need to keep a check on some of the sort of native plants that are very good. I suppose they're, they're not native invasives, I suppose. And hogweed is um, is a very good one. <laughs> it does spread really quickly. But um, in terms of biodiversity, the flowers are really splendid. They are really splendid for hoverflies and dayfly moths. They they take and they take a lot of food from those. So if you can, maybe before it, after it's flowered. And before it sets seeds, just cut the flower heads off and compost them. And then, um, yeah, if you've if you've got um, scope, um, dig them out. But the the main thing to to mention about hogweed is that um, obviously if if you get any of the sap on you, I'm just probably teaching to suck eggs here. But if you get any of the sap on you, and then you're out in the sun, you, you get these? hideous blisters. So it's just just be mindful of that that's like a health and safety thing and they are very very painful I'm speaking from experience they're very very painful um so yes um but uh yeah I would say just if it's like a mass if there's a massive amount just try and just tackle one area um and then I suppose what you could do as a quick job is basically just cut off the heads after they flowered so that um you're not impacting the biodiversity there uh yeah I think that's I think that's all the questions um yeah well, so beautiful yeah. flower louise thank you so much for um going through um some of those sort of pointers for us um i've actually learned um a little bit too um <laughs> um and it's great to um yeah have some links to organizations that can specialize in sort of additional advice and things so um once again thank you very much um and um we'll see you we'll see you soon thanks Thank you.